am Zoe Ryder. I am representative to the US Acting for Transparency International. In case you don't know who we are, Transparency International is the international network of anti corruption organizations. We have over 100 anti corruption organizations around the world uh, tackling corruption. Go <laughs> figure. Um, and we're really thrilled to be here today for the inaugural event uh, for the Democracy Dialogue. And we're going to kick off the first Democracy Dialogue in a second. But first, I'd like to introduce Meta, who will be talking about what this is the big initiative that this is a part of and why we're all here today. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, so again, my name is Netta Zofi. Um, I'm the director here at the Open Gov Hub. Um, and on behalf of all of us um, at the Open Gov Hub, Global Integrity, the Sunlap Foundation, and Transparency International, um, I'm really delighted to welcome you to our launch event for this new program, Defending Democracy, Lessons from Around the World. Um, so this new program aims to highlight lessons from international experiences with backsliding democracy and with authoritarianism to support the efforts of American democracy advocates um, who are facing increasingly unprecedented threats to norms and values that we've long uh, been taken for granted here at home. Um, so all of us here know that there are many re reasons to be concerned about the state of democracy here in the United States and around the world. Uh, whether we look to issues like conflict of interest in the current administration, uh, election fraud, depolarization, uh, loss of trust in government and in the media. Um, so this program was really born out of a widespread desire to better kind of understand these warning signs and red flags of democratic degradation. Um, and we all know that the threats um, to democracy not only here but in other countries are really global in nature. Um, that's why we believe that it will be so valuable to provide this platform to exchange experiences and ideas across borders. Um, because increasingly corruption knows no bounds and we see authoritarians themselves mimicking each other often and fighting back. Um, and the rise of authoritarian practices, of course, really, you know, seems to be a global trend. Um, I'm sure many people here are familiar with the Civicus report that came out earlier this year, which noted that over 100 countries have witnessed um, a decline in civic space, the ability for people to freely speak and organize, um, just in the past year. Um, and uh, so we know that focusing also on the international linkages around issues of corruption and declining democracy um, are so critical and we're really excited to be doing that today in today's event and for our future events throughout this program. Um, so um, again, just to kind of uh, conclude uh, the introduction to this Defending Democracy program, um, it's for all these reasons that we're launching this program that's focused on comparative learning um, and specifically around three broad themes, corruption, uh, civic and press freedoms and elections. Um, and especially for today, I think we'll get uh, be able to jump in deeply on uh, two of those three themes um, and surface up kind of conversations for future discussions. Um, so what you can look forward to throughout the coming year is that we'll be organizing uh, these democracy dialogue convenings about once per month, um, in addition to producing a series of short case study articles. Uh, with each convening and each article looking at a specific issue or threat to democracy, a specific context, and you know, uh, extrapolating lessons from the response to those challenges. Um, and we've been spending time this fall really trying to get to know the challenges that are facing US-focused organizations um, in order to plan our activities for the coming year. Um, and we're do we've done that through a variety of ways and have also introduced a survey, which um, we'll send to you all after today's event. Um, but just to give you a quick sense of, uh, from some of our preliminary conversations, um, some of the examples of future topics which we may cover in this program include uh, you know, looking at responses to misinformation in Ukraine, looking at prosecuting corruption in Peru, responding to nativist populism and civil society crackdowns in, in Hungary, looking at state controlled media in Venezuela, enforcing uh, access to information law in India, and much more. So there's really um, a huge spectrum of issues that, um, that we think can be relevant for the program, and I'd really encourage you um, to share those after this event uh, during our reception. Uh, we have some sticky notes set up over here. Um, would love to uh, kind of crowdsource your ideas on, on future convenience. Um, and so by doing all this work, we really hope to bring a kind of timely, badly needed space for cross-border learning about protecting and preserving democracy um, in order to help expose strategic lessons, cultivate solidarity, and uncover possible areas for partnerships. 
Um, and again, I know today's event in particular will highlight really inspiring examples of partnerships um, between journalists and advocates across borders to combat, uh, sorry, <laughs> to combat corruption and protect and promote <laughs> democracy. <laughs> um, so with all that, I just want to um, thank you all for being here. I want to thank um, the Omidyar Network also for helping provide a seed grant to launch this work. Um, and really encourage you all to stay in touch with us, whether you are more focused on U.S. domestic issues or international. Um, we really look forward to working together with all of you and learning from our um, exceptional panelists and speakers today, um, because really at the end of the day, democracy always needs defending. <laughs> so with that, thank you, and I'll um, hand it over to Zoe to moderate. shape the, the design of the session if we want to bring to the table. Um, and I think first and foremost is the point of view that corruption is a global phenomenon and cannot be addressed otherwise. The other point of view is that speaking truth to power isn't going so well for us these days in terms of defending democracy. Um, and that if you, if you agree that liberal democracies are in a state of destabilization, destabilization, then we think an anti-corruption approach is fundamental. And when we're talking about corruption, we're talking about PI's definition, and art is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain that goes above and beyond bribery, kickbacks. It's really about um, the abuse of entrusted power through all the many soft ways that generate very systemic corruption flows, what we call grand corruption. I don't want to speak too much because we're already now 20 minutes late, and so I'm going to just jump in. But first, I want to introduce this amazing panel. Um, we have Marina Walker, who is basically the force that managed the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers. She's deputy director uh, to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. We have <laughs> exactly. We have Paul Radu and Drew Sub Sullivan, who are the co-founders and directors of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, also a member of ICIJ, but in their own right have done some of this <coughs> path-breaking work to tackle corruption uh, and its relationship to corporate capture, organized crime, and illicit flows. And then, last but not least, we have my dear colleague, Ilya Shumanov, who is the deputy director for TI Russia, who himself has a background in investigation and has been working closely, um, as you will hear, with investigative journalists in the US on issues relating to Russians in America. So um, I'd like to get started. I think for one of the things, this is a conversation that's really meant to be a support to US civil society who considers that they really need to start maybe learning from others about what to do when, when the sort of epistemic shift in your country is pointing towards democratic weakening. And, and so this conversation is really also then meant to be primarily of use to the domestic anti-corruption civil society organizations who are here. Um, which is why we have two just amazing discussants. We have Danielle Bryan from the Project of Government Oversight and John Wunderlich from the Sunlight Foundation, who will be interrogating our panelists to find out, you know, what's in this for the fight at home here in the United States. So one of the things we wanted to hear about is, it seems like you guys, let's say OCCRP and ICIJ, I come from TI, we're an international network. I think there's somehow have this sort of magic sauce that helps you as an international network come out with some powerful collective. I don't even want to, I don't even know what, it's beyond reports, it's just, you know, it's a, a, a massive sea change in how we understand how power works in this cross border in this world. So is there like a special sauce you can tell us about? How did you get there? What do we need to know? If, civil society both domestically and working with international actors that we should keep in mind. I'll start with Marina. No, any good? I have no. 
There we go. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, this is a really important discussion at this time. I think that one of the things that we have going for us, both OCCRP and ICIJ, is that we were founded as networks. So from our funding principles, there was this idea of radical sharing that we have been nurturing and growing, in part uh, because of the challenges we face. We are trying to report about organized crime in an isolated hoarding of information, old fashioned long wolf reporter manner. That's not gonna take us anywhere. That uh, is just too difficult. It just doesn't uh, fit the current challenges. And so we realized uh, that we needed to have a much uh, more sophisticated, uh, organized manner of approaching these stories to be able to match uh, the, uh, the organized crime figures and the, organized, the different forms of organized legal corruption that we are trying to report. Um, and uh, if you think about the Panama Papers, uh, when these reporters in Germany, I think that one of the great things about the Panama Papers is that it, it, it's reporters in the mainstream media that get this information. And because they had been working with these networks of reporters before, they think about it for a couple of weeks and try to agonize and perhaps think that maybe they can do it alone. And very soon they say, we need to share it. And not only with a handful of trusted organizations or big media, that would be another temptation. Let's just go for the three biggest ones. But let's share it as far wide as possible so we can get that local knowledge that all corruption primarily is local. So let's get that local knowledge and then be, among all, you know, with all these hundreds of reporters, we can build a big global story of, uh, of secrecy and corruption. That is the story of, of Panama Papers and Paradise Papers. So uh, I would say the three just, you know, I don't want to go too long, but the three elements, you know, we call it the three T's is trust, so that we are trust among uh, reporters that is built over time uh, and through this collective work um, and something that can be translated to other sectors. I just had a call from a prosecutor. Uh, I'm not gonna say the country, but in South America that is prosecuting a big commodities company that was featured in the Paradise Papers. And he prosecutes environmental crimes. And what he's doing is he's reaching out to other prosecutors in other countries who are prosecuting the same company in different places. And for them, it's like we're learning, he said, from journalists that this is the only way we're going to get anywhere. I am too small. He was like, I'm just one guy in a corrupt country trying to take on a big corporate giant. And so they are taking you know, clues from what, what we're doing. The tax offices around the world are doing the same. There's a coalition of 30 tax agencies that have been working now for two or three years since the Panama Papers, a little bit before the Panama Papers, and then it took off after that. And now they are sharing information, they're meeting regularly, um, which is a big step forward. So trust technology, I'm sure we'll talk more about it. We need to be much smarter about how we use technology to tackle these stories. Uh, and not only being able to process uh, enormous amounts of unstructured data like we did with, with these two investigations, more than 30 million documents, but also using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we are not just relying on what we know, which is limited, but we allow computers to help us know what we don't know and find those, find those patterns of undoing that we're missing. And the third one is teamwork, which is, you know, we have the technology, the trust, now let's work together and let's work, and, that, and that's something else we're going to discuss, who works together. Um, so we are working together with whistleblowers, with crucial. we're working together with journalists from all different backgrounds, and we're working together with the mainstream media, because they have a publication platform, and if we can, and I say this word between, you know, uh, quote unquote, if we co-opt the media, and we make them care, and we, and we can bring stories and data to them that they will drop everything else they're doing, and they're going to do these corruption stories that matter, I think that that's a big achievement. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to follow up on the technology question, but first, uh, if maybe Paul and Drew, you guys are our partners with Transparency International <coughs> in the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. So you, your, your modus operandi vis-a-vis -vis that project is a little different. I'm wondering if you can talk about the sort of genesis of that what you think, why you think that that kind of work is needed 
and sort of where you think it can go and, and what's the big missing. Okay. Um, the, uh, the the concept, you know, we we uh, we at OCCRP we started in Bosnia and Romania, and so we've always lived in kind of an area that that is a cross border area, and it's also an area where corruption is endemic. Um, and we had very little faith in government organs to to really change what was going on. So in, in a lot of senses, we we started off very much far behind uh, American media. So we always felt it was important to be a little bit more aggressive. And the idea of the GAC came about um, from looking at, you know, the ways that you stop corruption. And, and really, you know, the first part of that is you have to expose the corruption. Um, and then people have to, to, to act on it. You have to have activists who say, this is wrong, we need to change it. You need policymakers to say, okay, here's some good policies to fix it. Um, and so uh, the problem in our part of the world is things really never got past the first step of exposure. And so the, the thought was, is, you know, we really need to, to be a little different. You know, the, the, the concept of media in America is a very specific media, is an idea that's based on our history and everything. And outside of, of you know, in another part of the world as a global organization, we had a little bit more freedom, I think, to move around. So. Um, the opportunity came up and talking to TI, you know, they're very similar to us. They're, they're, an organ, and they're a network of independent partner organizations. So it looks very similar to us. And we immediately realized we could find common cause. We can report the stories. We can do the kind of work. We can tell the truth and run. Um, but then we can also give all our data and all our information instead of letting it just lie sallow, to, to give it to somebody else who could go to the next step and then they could eventually take it to the next step to law enforcement or, or could act. So it, it really seemed like a good partnership. It's controversial because, you know, in America, you don't deal with activists. Activists are, that's a dirty name. You know, you're, you're supposed to be, you know, the, the hallowed, you know, uh, you know, tower of uh, virtuous uh, activity as a, as a journalist. And, um, you know, our thought was it's never going to get done. Um, and that we could, we could keep ourselves separate from, you know, we we look at the, the vision of what might we, we look at the truth, and then and then they can act on the truth, and we don't dictate how they act on the truth, and they don't dictate what truth we find, and that was kind of the concept behind it. And I'm not going to say that it's worked completely without problems. There's you know this is an experiment, and um, but so far in a couple cases it's shown to be much more powerful because when you have a story come out, you know most um, you know, politicians sit and kind of wait a couple beats to see if they got away with it, you know, and when the calls start to come in, then they realize, okay, now we have to act. Well, now we can kind of premeditate, that's all premeditated, and we know the calls are coming in, and the calls are educated calls that have the information and, and the knowledge and a, uh, a point. And so um, in, in the, a few cases so far, it's already been very, very successful. And you know, this is a model I think that that all media will have to adopt at some point, where where it's not just a matter of telling the truth; it's a matter of changing society in some way. Um, it's just you know you can't have all you know one person be judge, jury, and executioner. You know, you have to split that up. Uh, just to add a few words to that. It's um, I mean, for the past ten years, we uh, talked a lot with crime people, criminals. You know. And uh, we learn a lot from them, you know, we learn how they operate, how, how they, you know, operate across many frontiers, you know, how, how they use the system, how they use politicians and all that. But what we also re realized when we were interviewing these guys is that we know so little compared to what they know. So, you know, I'm very proud of our work. It's, it's great. But in terms of efficiency, we're not that efficient. You know, we're just investigating corruption where we know there is corruption, you know, and, and, and such. So, and... So the idea is to change investigative reporting, to look for corruption where you don't know there is corruption, you know? and that's done through tech. And uh, I, I think we'll we'll, uh, we'll 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 talk about that. But you know, criminals are are for us a source of uh, information and also a source of inspiration, you know, because these guys really have no boundaries, and and it's really important to get them to get what they are about and why are they you know operating in this way that they're operating. And how come they have in their pockets, you know, uh, people that are very important in the world, you know, politicians and all that. 
Thank you. Um, we are going to loop back to a couple of, of the issues you've talked on, sort of the technologies that you're using and how we have to sort of retool as anti-corruption activists, which I would argue OCCRP is an anti-corruption activist, and ICIJ is part of the civil society of anti-corruption as well. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I'd, I'd like to, to turn over to Ilya um, to talk a bit. Uh, I hear you guys have a, a problem also with corruption in your country, and maybe if you could, <laughs> if you could talk about STI Russia, uh, some of the ways in which you're dealing with it. But when I make that joke, actually, you've had, I've spent a lot of time with, with, with these folks today having very interesting conversations, and I think we all agree this is not a story about Trump and this is not a story about Russia. Our work is a story about corporate capture, it's a story about Western enablers, it's a story about kleptocrats, but it is, as you said, a global system of business <coughs> that is undermining democracy, it's undermining economic equality, and it's undermining people's right to have uh, governments working in the favor of the public interest as opposed to national. So, um, do you want to? Yeah, I, I would like to start um, from the question that was asked to me, was asked to me, uh, one colleague who was sitting on this uh, uh, call. He asked me why is still uh, existing Transparency International Russia in Russia because of the many questions, because uh, of the um, lack of transparency, because uh, of the big pressure from the government side. And it's a very, very good question because. Uh, this question I answer, ask uh, myself every day, and I have no answer. Uh, maybe uh, the government still wanted to to have some organization like Transparency International in Russia. Maybe because of the uh, some external pressure on the government, that's why uh, we are still existing. Yeah, uh, your question was about the uh, Western neighbors and. Uh, uh, the old system, how it works, I don't know how. Maybe colleagues from OCRP and SAG will answer on this question. I will speak only about my experience of cooperation with uh, uh, US journalists and how it uh, appeared. Uh, two years ago, we, have, uh, we had a joint project, we started a joint project with the colleagues from Sunlight Foundation for sitting on this uh, call. I'm very glad to uh, be in co contact with you. And we started with a small step. Uh, we organized a joint training for Russian journalists and US journalists. And this training grew up onto the one amazing story. We started to uh, uh, cooperation with Miami Herald journalists that we issued some amazing articles, I think, so about Russia in Miami. And this article was about the Russian dirty money that goes from that goes from the Russian side, uh, uh, from Russian uh, public officials and Russian uh, law enforcement officers, generals to the Miami property. And it's a wonderful story that uh, showed us that uh, there's no borders for corruption. And I think it's another point that we have to mention, that corrupt officials are using the same vehicles as a terrorist as uh, organizing crime groups, and uh, we have to focus not only on the ultimate beneficiaries of this property and companies, but uh, on uh, enablers who are really facilitating of this process. Another point, and I, speak, I think that uh, we will discuss this point later, yeah, but uh, I will, would like to, to speak about some examples. For example, we are Starting uh, one of the cases in Russia, it was a small case about the deputy mayor of Moscow. Um, I think small case, yeah. And uh, we found out that his partners were the same, um, uh, had, uh, was owner of the same company, and the nominal directors of this company was the same person uh, who uh, was the head of the company that uh, uh, we were involved in the scheme of avoiding Iran sanctions. The story shows that uh, there is no, uh, there are same facilitators, same units that are using for uh, money laundering and for uh, avoiding sanctions globally. 
Uh, and uh, why I'm sitting here, because uh, Transparency International is a global organization. We have a big network of uh, chapters, more than 100 chapters. And uh, I think that uh, Transparency United States uh, is, is not existing now yet, but uh, uh, maybe in the small uh, future we will see a new chapter here. And I hope we will have a good cooperation with it, because uh, a lot of money, a lot of ties, a lot of influence goes from the United States of America. And I think it's a good point for starting cooperation to creating these chapters here. And I, I will, I'm very glad to, to start maybe this cooperation now. Um, what are the technology? I really want the people to hear what I've heard to say about the technology that you guys are trying to pilot. That might be an actual way to respond in 2017 and 2025 to the tactics of, of grant corruption, systemic corruption. Okay. Um, well, one of the you know one of the problems is you know uh, you know t technology um, you know that the, the basically corruption is is a global phenomenon as we all know but it's a very efficient global phenomenon that that moves to really all countries and um it moves across borders and of course law enforcement can't go across borders we are really journalists and, and activists are the only kind of natural enemy um for corruption in the wild and so you know we really need to be the ones that that, that you know really track it down and the problem is because it, it is so um, uh, efficiently moving around the world through the help of uh, what we call the criminal services industry, you know, the billion dollar industry that helps criminals, you know, avoid problems. We have to find new ways of kind of really looking at this issue. So we've been working with ICIJ um, uh, on a new program we, we call Project Crystal, which is basically a machine learning, you know, intelligence, artificial intelligence system that was being designed by the folks who did uh, Google Knowledge Graph. Um, and the idea is, is to get ahead of, you know, these problems by looking at all the data, combining everything together, and then using the power of, you know, the rich data that we have in the world to, um, to basically model and, and figure out where you've got, you know, corruption. By putting all the pieces together in so many different places, you find corruption. Corruption is like when you go to most developing countries, it's like being in South Africa in the 1860s and you can walk down the beach and kick up 10 carat diamonds, you know, just lying there and you can pick them up. It's all over the place. It's not, it hasn't had to be very well hidden. And uh, as it crosses borders, it doesn't get hidden. And it's much bigger than people think. I mean, you know, you see all sorts of statistics, but when you live in these world, in these, in these places, you realize we, we are in the midst of the largest transfer of wealth from poor countries to rich countries in the history of man. And, and maybe this conquistadors, that was about the only other time. And you know, what it does is it's really costing us, you know, in America by having these large amounts of resources and funds going into, into building apartments that nobody will ever live in. Um, and and in, in Kazakhstan, it's making small businesses pay almost usury rates to get loans um, so it's really basically bankrupting. It's it's hurting both both places. So so how do you catch this? I mean, you need the technology. You need you know, crime is like um, crime and corruption is is money and power. And money and power does not change hands very often. It's very very static. So you can actually model that. You can model you know uh, money and power, and that's what we really need to do. And even though they they hide behind you know these these uh, these these offshore companies can only hide for so long. It's still, as more and more information comes out, as another Panama paper leaks comes out, it's literally, you know, we haven't even seen the best stories out of Panama. Well, maybe we've seen the best stories, but there's a lot more stories in Panama papers because we don't know what it means yet. And we won't know for many, many years what it means. And in fact, in Paradise Papers, there was a lot of Panama paper stories because it was the Paradise paper leak that led to us understanding what was in the Panama papers. And there's literally hundreds more of these stories that are out there. And as you get more of these leaks, you get more and more data, and you can put all the pieces together. And that's what technology allows us to do, it allows us to put all these pieces together, to figure out what the models are of corruption, and to be able to track those models and expose it. So now we can do stories a lot faster. 
rather every story, every investigative story is a custom made piece of work. It's like a fine portrait or something where you spend nine months doing it. We can't do that anymore. We just, it's in the resources. We need to do that in three months. And technology can speed up that process. And so that's what we're really looking at. And there, the third time I, um, I just want to say that these collaborations, these large-scale large collaborations are also great equalizers because uh, reporters, we're not just talking again about big media, we're talking about reporters, 332 reporters in Paradise Papers, a similar number in Panama Papers, and they are sitting all over the world. They are in Burkina Faso, they are in Niger, they are in Chile, they are in China. And what, what we collectively have achieved is we have been able to uh, ingest uh, an amount of documents that would fill maybe this entire floor into computers, make them readable, extract entities, and put it in a platform that allows the reporter in Niger and Burkina Faso to type a name of a person of interest, an associate of the prime minister, or a criminal, or a company, or the name of whatever, or whatever word, and get results from that pile of documents that would cover the entire size of this floor. And so that is in itself a big achieve achievement, uh, but there's so much more, as we have said, that we could be doing. In Paradise Papers, we experimented with machine learning in that we taught computers to recognize loans, because we know that loans is such a, 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 an interesting and important indicator of money transfers, of money laundering sometimes, of profit, profit shifting. So we said, okay, we want to see we want the machine to understand what these documents look like when they are loans and to index them and to give us a little summary of the loan. And that is sped up the process enormously, for example, when we were investigating Glencore, which was a giant, it is a giant company, a very controversial one, and there were so many loans um, uh, involved in the Paradise Papers related to uh, Glencore. So, um, what else was I going to say? Um, did I forget? Probably. But I think that that's, uh, you know, we need to work a lot more with those reporters in those countries to continue to, to um, make this information available to them because they have, again, that local knowledge that we need. It's them who identify the stories that matter in this giant data set. It's not so much the reporters sitting in the UK or the US, although they also play a huge role. I think it's, it's really small steps, but for instance, we're launching next week this uh, initiative that we call CPR, Crime Pattern Reporting. And this is, uh, it's, it's again, it's a, uh, about putting a little bit more science in investigative reporting. So what CPR is doing right now uh, is, uh, you know, it takes a pattern, a crime pattern from an indictment or from a text, you know, from an article. And then it changes that into, uh, into a search string, search query, like if this and that, for instance, if mayor in this city want to bid, you know, to rebuild the highway and use the company owned by a company in Belize and so on and so on, you know, that means, you know, corruption. But then you take that string and you, uh, you know, and you apply that uh, query over other data sets where you don't know that there is corruption. And suddenly a journalist elsewhere in the world receives an alert saying, hey, you should be looking into this. So the idea is not to rely that much on sources, not to rely that much on leaks and all this, but to rely on the machine finding the patterns, the corruption patterns, and of course afterwards you have to do the real work, you know, the field work and all that. But it's really about, you know, changing journalism and the way we do things right now and putting a little bit more science. So the reporters will have to, like, install a program in their computer to read those documents? Uh, so this will be a website where everybody can subscribe and give their, uh, you know, uh, interest, you know, in, uh, you know, in terms of country, in terms of geography and all that, and things, and then they will get this other. Uh, look, there's, you know, corruption case potentially in, in your phone. And I remember what I was going to say before, was, which is that even though we have made great progress in sharing and these big leaks have been shared, there's so much data that reporters have and they are sitting on that they use a little part of it and the rest is there and that is not connected. So the next step and what we've been talking about is how do we connect this amazing data from 200 countries that investigative reporters have in their computers and that right now is for the most part not talking to one another. And, and even for that matter, I mean, sunlight has a lot of data. You know, that's not talking to anybody right now. 
Um, you know, uh, TI has got a lot of data that could be talking to people. So in all of your organization, there's tons of data not talking to each other. You know, we need to, we need to get this where we're efficiently able to, you know, combine large amounts of data sets together to find what we're looking at. So it's often the needle in the haystack, you know, but, but when you've got, you know, a million machines, you know, working, you know, uh, in various centers around the world, look, you know, we're going to find a, a lot more needles a lot quicker. And that leads to a lot more stories, a lot more impact, and a lot more change. I would like to add a short comment. Um, I think that the back with the cash, it's the day before yesterday. Um, electronic payments, it's uh, the same, it's yesterday. Uh, today is a Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrency. We do only the first steps, I mean, transparency in Russia and uh, globally. Uh, and focusing on the cryptocurrency and uh, using this uh, uh, currency as a money laundering uh, instrument. And it's very uh, new and very huge topic. And we do the first step with the high school of uh, uh, economy in, in uh, Moscow. And uh, we have some ideas, some, uh, some focusing on the future. And uh, I think if uh, there is any kind of uh, interest of the story, we we'll, can do some joint issues and some joint projects. Thank you. I suspect there will be interest. I'm going to add one more question before I ask our discussants to come up. Um, and, and that is, okay, so you guys have done these amazing reports, whether it's the Russians in Miami, all the work that you guys have done around the paradise papers. How do you get people to care enough in a sustained way that really pressures elected officials to do something different? That's it easy. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, 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 that's a tough question. I mean, here, here's the thing. I think journalism has failed um, uh, in, in a large part over the last 25 years. Um, uh, it's failed because we really haven't evolved our model very effectively. And, you know, um, we need to reinvent, especially investigative reporting. It's data rich, um, it's information rich, and we're not really giving that information to the users, and we're not allowing the users to interact with the, the information in a very effective way. So, I mean, I think we have a lot of work to do at reinventing investigative journalism. Um, and this is an ongoing process. A lot of people are working on this um, in, in small parts, but you know, it, it, if you want people to be convinced of the information, if you want people to believe the information, you have to give them an ability to play with the information themselves and to look through it. Um, and we're not really truly doing that. And so that, I think, is one of the next steps. And then, you know, we're still using the same two-dimensional, event-driven kind of model for an investigative story that we've been using since, you know, 1860. Um, and that really has to be, be re-examined and, and looked at. You know, uh, as I said, you know, money and power is a topography. That topography is out there. We need to give people access to that topography. We need to let them explore it. We need to let them put their local, you know, leaders in and the local businessman and find the information, you know. Um, you know and then we need to market it. We need to get it out into other streams. So investigative and reporting in the future might be TripAdvisor, you know, giving you a notification that that hotel that you're booking in Trinidad and Tobago is owned by, you know, the Solzhenitskaya Bratsva, you know, in Moscow from drug, you know, proceeds, you know, which allows then the, the user to decide whether they want to give the money to that particular organization. It, it basically en enables the audience to get involved. That may be investigative reporting that back that, but it's, a, it's news you can use in the sense that you're getting it in other formats. And, and, you know, we, we see the future of OCCRP um, not being necessarily selling news stories, which we don't sell anyway, um, because news organizations are cheap, um, but we see it as API calls to, you know, some curated database on organized crime, and that will be the future of journalism. You know, so, so I think we really need to look at this in a radically different way. The world has changed radically, and we're still thinking about it the old way. We need to really think about how people use information and putting that information in front of them when they need it for that decision they need to make right there. 
And it's true what has been said before that there has been a reluctance, especially in this country, to for investigative journalists to think about impact because it was uh, seen as like you are getting involved, you are taking an activist role. And I think that that's another thing that needs to change radically. At ICIJ, we ask ourselves three things before we even do a story or start a project. One is, is this an issue of global concern? Because we have decided that the world is our niche. The second is, uh, are, are, the, are the people, um, are the systems designed to protect people broken? And this is who is the victim and is it systemic? And the third one is, are we likely to get a result? And if the third question is no, we, will, we might rethink the idea. Or like, so we want to be very intentional about that. We are not here to do vanity journalism that helps nobody. And when we can uh, not do vanity journalism and when we can explain to people clearly in the second or first paragraph of a story that the victim of the Paradise, paradise Papers, and they don't have to scratch their heads, is them. <laughs> it's everybody that is reading that story. They are the victims, or like the 99% of the population are the victims in the story. If they get that, then they actually do things. And in Panama Papers, we saw that in Iceland, they took down their prime minister. And then also, surprise, in Pakistan, in Pakistan, nine months later, they took down their prime minister. And, and, and just to add on that, I mean, I think one of our tasks, one of our goals is to hurt the criminals as well. So, I mean, what we give with our stories is context. But inside that context, there's a lot of crime happening. So we also need to change the way we present, we introduce investigative reporting, you know, going from the static stories to something that is alive, I mean, for a long period of time. And for instance, you know, simple steps towards that is like, you have a text where you have, where you put in, you know, lots of uh, the company names and person's names and all that. And on top of that, it's quite easy actually to add a tech level where all those names are uh, continuously, you know, looked up, you know, uh, in, in various databases, so to actually have, have updates on what's going on with those uh, characters, those companies, so that uh, we're doing this right now with uh, companies from the UK, you know, so each company in the UK mentioned in our reporting, we can track down what's going on in the future with that company, you know, and this is information that is very valuable, you know, uh, to banks, for instance, you know, where these people and these entities want to open up accounts, and to many, many other, you know, so it's, it's, it's of course, uh, about the readers, but it's also about hurting the criminals. It's also about uh, giving services to other people that can make something out of our report. One of the most traffic parts of, of our website is the so-called offshore leaks database that I hope you have visited, which has information on more than 500,000 offshore companies that were secret before and that now are public. <coughs> and I remember when we first thought about putting this database out, and it has to do with what you were saying about being transparent and sharing with reader as much, readers as much as you can share, our lawyers were expecting, um, what was the word, uh, like I think a rain of lawsuits. Like, um, but, but they still allow us to go ahead because the, the principle of transparency and the, the fact that the information of who owns the company should be public and transparent was uh, more important than, than in this case than the possible legal concerns. And I'm happy to report and I touch wood that there has been no lawsuit. As a result, it's a very lively database. We hear a lot from some of the people that are featured there. We respond to every single um, letter and email that we get. And uh, it's being used widely by prosecutors, by other investigators, and by common citizens who submit co um, their tips based on the research that they are doing in that database. Thank you. And I think that's also another way in where spaces are shrinking democracy, it's really good to have alternative vehicles for victims to witness the corruption to come forward. That's something that CI has been working to create in our system as well. And I think it's a space where investigative journalists and anti-corruption activists have sort of built up a natural symbiotic relationship. Um, as an American anti-corruption activist, I'm very curious about what about this is useful of interest to the people fighting this fight here in the U.S. And so I'm very excited to have Danielle and John come up, take a seat in the high chairs. Do you want, John, do you want to stand? And um, just sort of react to what they've heard, interrogate 
problem with my uh, <laughs> Sorry. And part of what's exciting for me as um, as having been a I'm with the, an organization called the Project on Government Oversight, and we're entirely domestically focused. And our tagline for our organization is exposing corruption, exploring solutions. But we almost never use it publicly because in America, what what is corrupt isn't illegal, and it's actually legalized corruption. And so people in America just don't think of these problems of the body as corruption. So I think we should all in the United States start talking about this as corruption much more often, accepting it as part of it. The first question I have is, uh, you're talking about a network uh, that spans borders and, and languages, so that it has to be uh, your network has to be involving people who don't know each other. In the United States, we have a universe of organizations. We all know each other. We have various lunches that we go to every month. You know, so to us, we know who, who to trust. But we've seen, especially in the United States, but I'm sure around the world, that there are opposers who, who are pretending to be allies, but not. And how do you all bet who your trusted allies are? <laughs> Um, I would say, I don't know, I, I, the, the global investigative journalism community is big, but it's, I don't think it's that huge. And we also have our ways and our forums uh, where we meet, uh, the Global Investigative Journalism Conference, for example, that just happened in South Africa. Uh, so and maybe, unfortunately, it's not that huge of a universe, and you can do pretty good background, and you do know who's doing the work and, and who's getting published and who is making a difference in each country. So, uh, and between the two networks are pretty complementary. Um, you are, they are working in places that we are not and vice versa and we can uh, advise each other. But we do a very thorough vetting of who we work with. And in our case, uh, when we invite to these collaborations, it's not just a vetting of who is a great and obviously a, a legitimate, but also a great skilled reporter but also who is a good collaborator and a good person. And that's something that before we didn't used to pay attention to. We just wanted the aggressive, the best, the, and, and then we got a lot of egos. And you know what? You can't collaborate. You cannot do the Panama Papers if you have a bunch of egomaniacs that you, know, <laughs> you just can't do it. And so now we have that criteria that we also look for the nice people. And they actually exist, and it's amazing and efficient to work with them. Well, one, one, uh, you know, we, 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 um, we've not always succeeded on that issue, and <laughs> we've been failed, and, and we've been duped, and uh, we've wasted money on on people. You know, in most cases, all you need is a couple good people in every country, and then they can start to, you know, network you to the people who you really need to be dealing with. But you know, in, in investigative reporting, it is a small. People think there are lots of investigative reporters. It's probably Three or four thousand worldwide, you know, at most, maybe even less. Um, and uh, it's, it takes a decade to mint a great investigative reporter if they're not already born. And so, you know, in investigative reporting, we find them pretty easy. But it's it's harder when you start talking, you know, about the activist community. That's where you, because in a lot of countries, you know, people are an activist not to beat the system, but to find an avenue into the system. You know, once you're a big of enough annoyance, you get a government grant and then you stop criticizing the government and you walk away with a nice income for years. And this has happened literally hundreds of times in my experience. So that's it's much harder in the activist community. And that's really where the challenge is. And I don't have a good answer, except, you know, it's just hard fought going through and working with a large number of people and building up a a group of people that you trust. And it's always, I mean, are the strengths of both our organization, all three of the organizations up here, is they have bodies in all these countries. And just, uh, I mean, what we do usually to find new people is we organize these workshops um, that are based on, I mean, real data and work. And then we assign small tasks to the, to the people that are uh, in, in those workshops. And then we see how they work, how they play out. And then we engage them gradually, you know, and we assign them uh, you know, tasks and tasks after tasks, and then you know, after a while, we we uh, we gain the trust. They, they they gain ours. So some of our greatest reporters were found this way. You know, just via workshops, just like that. 
Yeah, I would like to add. For example, according to our story, uh, we found the win-win strategy because of the uh, Miami Herald is based in the uh, United States of America and we are based in Russia and there is no point for competition between us. It's um, They publish the same story in the United States, we publish the same story in Russia, even we are a uh, non-government organization, we do some investigative work and it works. We need strategy. Uh, so I'm uh, John Wunderlich from the Sunlight Foundation, uh, and I try to keep it short and, and ask a couple questions for you all. But I, I wanted to reflect first that when we were when we were first thinking about this series of, of events, we kept thinking like, oh, we would have someone from Argentina who dealt with it when the Argentinian statistics were being faked. It would be great to hear about their experience dealing with that national level problem. Um, this is. A, I'm sure that panel will be great when it happens, but this is a really great panel to me. It makes me very happy that you're all here. Um, and part of the reason for that, I think, is that the collaborations that you've all managed to create actually feels proportional to the problem. It's not solving it. it, it, it a lot of it wasn't illegal. There's not a, a whole bunch of bills that were introduced. It's an uphill battle. But, but the reporting defies the typical form of what journalism is, which is there's a scoop and then there is a story and there's a little bit of shame and then maybe eventually a bill and maybe someone resigns. No, instead, this is a cache of documents that displays how a massive uh, unjust system functions. And so what I'm reflecting on is that what, what you're all doing is at such a coordinated and massive scale that is starting to reflect the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. And as an advocate in the US, that makes me reflect, well, what is our role? What is our role to, to respond proportionally to the barriers and failures and decay that's happening within our own democracy and the responsibility that we have in the world when American democracy has played the role that it has played? I mean, look at every, so many issues, the energy policy or the environment or, or FCPA or energy, where global leadership comes down to really deals between a couple world leaders where suddenly we've got rot and self-interest. So my reflection right now is what's our responsibility as advocates in the U.S. and as collaborators? What kind of reform agenda, what kind of collaboration is proportional to the moment that we're at? And I, I, this is an impossible question, but I ask you that because I'm inspired by the, the collaboration that you've all tried. That was, a, that was my question. That was a, okay. <laughs> so, so um, I mean, for, for, first of all, it, it's a very good point. And I mean, I, I'm here to tell you that, you know, it's far worse out there than people think. I mean, <laughs> the, the, I mean let, let me put it this way. We, we have a globing, global competing economic system that's based on corruption and opaque structures offshore. And that's growing. Um, and basically, all the developing world countries are using this system, and, and it's corrupting the the Western system, um, and uh, that's a real serious problem. So um, the the first thing is is I mean it's it's great to have these kind of discussions where the international people work with the local people because we we had a really serious problem when we started trying to work in the United States that you know news media just didn't care, you know it was an international story they didn't care. Um, and after the Trump administration came into power, that changed a lot of people's minds on things. And, they, and we started to get calls saying, hey, uh, you're working in Russia, aren't you? Um, you know, and that really, you know, it, it was way, way too late. Um, and uh, what we really need to do is the United States needs to get um, basically connected to this global system because you have such wonderful resources, such wonderful skills. Um, and it's just really been a matter of attitude. And if you look at donors, you know, say, okay, this is American funding, this is international funding. You know, we, we can't find a, a grant that, that, <laughs> that, that goes across both. You know, donors don't do that. So, I mean, it, it's this process of really, you know, we, we've looked at things in a certain way for too long and we need to really change it. So um, I think the big step is to get the activists um, connected with the international activists. Um, and, and the, the international journalists connected to the American journalists. The American journalists are the worst. They, I hate dealing with American journalists, and I'm an American. 
they are such a pain in the ass, I will tell you, because they still see the world in, in terms of newspaper competition. We openly tell people what our stories are before we publish them because we don't care. Well, because if somebody says, hey, I'm interested in that story too, we say, great, you want to cooperate. Um, because we don't have a, we're nonprofit, we're not a competitive thing. So, you know, the idea is just to get more of those connections. It's, it's severed. We're like, you know, one of those people with brains that are disconnected and we need to connect our brains. I just make a quick comment on, on the issue that um, you guys both mentioned uh, about legal corruption. And I think that's, that's a big problem. These, uh, the Paradise Papers have gotten a lot more pushback and it has gotten pushback from, pro from progressive sectors, which is not a surprise because the biggest pot of offshore money we found in the Paradise Paper belongs to one of the biggest donors to the Democratic Party. And that's uh, Mr. James Simons, uh, whose profile you can read in the New Yorker this week. Uh, and this gentleman, uh, along with Gary Cohn, the chief economic advisor of President Trump, they are saying, don't make us uncomfortable. What are these questions? This is the way, and what they said is like, this is the way the world works. And this is the way the world works, a world in which 1% of the population controls 50% of the wealth, and 10% of the population controls 80% of, of the world's wealth. And so, of course, that's the way it works for them to belong to that 1% or 10%. And it doesn't matter the political party. At that level, they are all united. The 13 people that we found in the Paradise Papers connected to President Trump and the biggest donor to the Democratic Party. And they were saying, this is the system we have decided that is going to exist and that is going to be legal and you really shouldn't be probing this system. And the media for many years has been repeating this thing and has been believing it and editors have been believing it it's changing now with these investigations because, again, we're trying to co-op them <laughs> successfully. And so a lot of at least 91 media organizations that work with us uh, now understand that this is an even more important story than, than a politician hiding money in their freezer like they do in my country in Argentina. Or, and here, too. I think we found one recently. Um, <laughs> it looks like it's, yeah. So also, how do we help... Uh, everyone from newspaper editors to reporters to the public uh, at large, again, understand the importance of these uh, stories of legal corruption and the secrecy and the offshore world. Uh, one of the things that's become clear in the last year has been how much U.S. law facilitates global corruption. And, uh, and as you were describing uh, the the world of journalism in the United States still pretty much thinks of itself as completely separate from those of us in the NGO world that are working on advocacy to fix these problems. Is there a way, uh, even for the existing <coughs> projects you already have out there, uh, to, to bring in the NGO, the U.S. NGO world that's trying to help fix the laws so that we could be learning, you know, do you have Sherpas that help go through your <laughs> databases for our investigators and our organizations? You know, because I fully appreciate the value of working with the New Yorker and other publications because of their platforms, but there's also the other world in the United States that really wants to help fix these laws. Um, and is there some kind of collaboration that we could work with you? Because many of our organizations, I mean, my organization has, for example, a database of all the federal uh, companies, the companies, the federal contractors, and all of their misconduct in, in one database. It's not talking to your databases, but there's something important. There's another colleague organization called uh, Good Jobs First that has all the violations that every company in America has um, um, committed, uh, or the Center for Responsive Politics. There's all these different groups that are here working to fix problems. And so we all collected working with your journalists. I mean, yes, of course, uh, it's uh, not hard to, you know, exchange data set and to cross-reference uh, data sets. And I think data is key to this. Uh, I think what we do have, you know, is like terabytes and terabytes of data. And this is uh, data about criminals from Eastern Europe, from Africa, from other continents. But we have very little when it comes to the U.S. 
So uh, cross-searching our databases and creating systems where we can leverage our know-how, because know-how and context is so important, I think that's, you know, that could be a very solid base for the future cooperation, you know, but let's, let's start, just start somewhere. And I think Ilya, you know, is working on these projects, you know, just simple projects of mapping property owned by wealthy Russians in the U.S., you know. So these sort of projects can be very efficient, very effective, and then we can go from there and move, you know, higher and higher, you know, to identify patterns used by uh, transcontinental organized crime and uh, their investments and, and so on. Good advice. Um, did you want to? Yeah. I would like to add, um, of course, as information about the beneficial ownership of the companies and the beneficial ownership of the property is a key point, as uh, Paul mentioned. I think that we have a good example of Transparency International Russia as an organization who can work with organized crime and reporting project as a partner without any kind of form of competition or untrust. Yeah, and and we have not very good environment, you know, maybe, you know, yeah, and I think that the United States is still have the opportunity to, to do some work on, from the NGO side, I think so. Yeah. One quick thing, um, co cooperation is a bitch. I mean, it's <laughs> really, really hard to do. And and so what, what you need to do is, I think the whole key is that we're, we're always happy to cooperate, but it takes a long time. And, and to build up those relationships, build up the trust, you know, it, it's it's not always as easy as just exchanging data sets, but you know, there's different levels of cooperation, but it, it, if you make a commitment to do it and if you fight through it, and, you know, we had to do this in 40 countries in different languages and different cultures and different, you know, journalism and everything. And it took us damn near 10 years to do it. And so really um, it, it's important and if the story and the project is important enough to find a way of doing it. But we, what we don't have is a really good, I, I don't know what POGO does. I don't know enough of what, you know, Sunlight does, and you don't know enough of what we do, and that's really what's gonna take a long time. We need to spend a lot of time talking, and, and that that's what is a, the, the barrier to quick and easy. So that's definitely a solvable problem. Right. <laughs> I wanted to ask you what, a, 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 how much are the NGOs collaborating and cooperating among themselves? Because, you know, as what, what I'm, what we're talking before about prosecutors trying to collaborate, tax agencies, and, you know, and I see some efforts, but are you guys really sharing, for example, your databases? Do you have like an information commons where everybody's contributing, where you have this knowledge hub for all the data you have? Um, you know, those things, you know, so that's one question for you. With the confidential documents, sometimes it's a little bit harder to share. Um, so that's the only thing I would say. I, I don't think that it's impossible to 100% no, never. And it's always important to have the dialogue. It's a little bit more difficult for sources issues and other issues to, to, to share uh, um, with non-journalists. But uh, our database can be downloaded as a spreadsheet. And so that the first step would be to cross-check it with your databases and see what uh, connections you find already in that information that we have made public. So, so just to say you get one more question because you guys uh, so speaking for all US NGOs, which is obviously a dangerous thing to do, I, I think I think we share a norm, but we have very close, very collaborative relationships. If anything, we run into diminishing returns from trying to coordinate too much. We're trying to combine every data database okay. and then it becomes complicated, but that's a good a good problem to have. Mm -hmm. um, but my question for you all is when you said coordination is so, is so difficult. I mean, I, I watched the hour-long Vice special that sort of was behind the scenes about the latest the latest release. And just the view that that, that, that left me with was that collaboration was pretty easy and that everyone pretty much agreed on the same publication date and all the journalists involved just had to get access to the data and agree not to share it. So my question for you is, was that, were those the secret ingredients and was it really that easy to get journalists to agree to access the data, to not share it, to all decide on the same publication date? Because we have done, this is kind of like the fifth or sixth of these global big ones based on leaks that we have done. I think by this time we have a pretty oiled machine 
and the teams they change from project to project but not dramatically so we have a lot of knowledge that is transferred and, and that stays in the network but some of the ingredients are, are those that you identified is having a, a, an agreement a clear few rules but very clear so don't overwhelm everybody with a ton of rules but the four or five that you do have repeat them all the time and make everybody really take them to heart uh, and that is not sharing the data, respecting the embargo, and uh, sharing is not uh, optional. It's something that if you don't do, you're not part of this. Um, and then uh, on the date, on the publication date, which we find that is really important that we publish simultaneously for effect, um, um, it's important that there be a neutral space, and in this case it's ICIJ, that can uh, take you know, a vote and can listen to everyone, but ultimately make a decision. Somebody at the end of the day has to make a decision about many things. And in this case, it has been, in other cases, it's OCCRP when we're collaborating with them in their investigations. But I think we play as a, as a, as a um, uh, investigative centers or NGOs a good, a good role, neutral space, so we, because the media would never be able to agree among themselves what is the best publication day. Um, so it's surrendering a little bit of that control into these uh, um, networks. I mean, one, one advantage in, in this particular case, I mean, ICAJ does a wonderful job, and they always have the best data, so everybody wants to cooperate with them, and everybody, you know, it, the, we all come to them, uh, although they really pick who they want to have um, on it, but they, you know, as soon as word gets out, you know, what data they have, everybody's calling them and everybody wants everything Marina has to uh, handle a lot of phone calls. But, you know, when you've got something that valuable, you know, it's easy to get people to behave a little bit. When you start putting a, a trafficking, you know, uh, anti-trafficking group together with a media group together with a tax group, you know, that's when you really start getting the difficulties in kind of combining cultures and doing other things. And when each has to go out and do their own work and, and you know, commit to that work, um, that's much, much harder to get organizations to do that. And that's where you really run into problems. So, you know, it's always best to just cherry pick, pick the best projects that you know is going to work and then work on those projects and then build that relationship so that next time you know, you can do it. And it is, ICIJ system is really down. So we, everybody knows what to expect ahead of time. You know, what, when's the date? When's the publication date? When, you know, uh, you know, what, where are we talking? You know, where, where's the information that we need? And then everything runs you know, really quite smoothly, but it, it's not so easy in most cases. Uh, and one last question. Uh, and uh, our organization was actually created by whistleblowers, and you mentioned the importance of whistleblowers. One of the things we're finding for our work, and in fact, we have a team of best journalists on our staff, so a weird hybrid. But uh, we're almost moving away from technology to communicate with them because of the dangers of the digital footprint in communicating with whistleblowers. And as we've seen, um, you know, I guess starting in a way with Chelsea Manning and reality winner, and frankly, all of the, I think maybe all of the prosecutions during the Obama administration for the Espionage Act were all because of whistleblowers communicating with journalists. Do you have any best practices? Because you've talked a lot about that, that how technology helps. Do you have tech, any best practices on how to protect those essential sources from the data? I mean, um, of course, we do, and, uh, um, what we do is we have a big tech team, uh, and their main concern is security. So we put together, you know, secure spaces where we cooperate, like in the case of Pana Papers or Paradise Papers, or uh, you know, the, uh, our our projects. Um, but it's really in the end about the hygiene, about the hygiene of each individual reporter. So what we're trying to do is to convince each of our reporters. To not only think about themselves and the source, but the whole environment around them. So it's not just about you know uh, cybersecurity; it's about physical security. It's about going way beyond you know what's just you know signal and, and all this. It's it's really we've had cases where you know people were um, really using lots of uh, security tools and encryption and all, but there was a camera installed in their apartment, you know, that were that was filming them at, at all times, you know. Uh, so um, this is something, I mean, um, uh, we're always assessing the risk. Uh, we're 
lots of times against people that have lots of resources, you know, that are attached to secret services and, and this type of resources. And it's really hard to, to fight that type of surveillance, you know. So what we're doing is we're trying to um, reduce it as much as possible, but we're always, you know, cautious with uh, how we do things. And we're, all, we're always, you know, thinking about the fact that, uh, you know, um, we can be exposed at, at all times, you know. So um, there are various issues around this, and perhaps we can, can talk a bit more about yeah, I mean, it, it's if you use something like Secure Drop or something like that, you can you can do that. Then you can transfer onto something. But most times, when people call you or send you an email, they've already outed themselves. So you know, and there's nothing you can do about that. We put instructions on our web page, and we hope that they address you know address us through one of the leaks platforms that they can reach us. And then after that, you you negotiate how and we're you do this regularly i mean there's different ways of doing it but you can set up an email account where you both log into the email account and then and then leave draft messages to each other you know we've used that quite a bit so so there are and like tactical tech in many of these organizations there's really good information uh, about there but you know it's educating people ahead of time to say hey don't call us don't send us an email don't you know you, you think you're safe setting up a, a Gmail account and then, you know, sending you something, but that can be traced back. And the problem is most whistleblowers don't know this. By the time they do, they've already potentially outed themselves. And, you know, whistleblowing is not a great career to go into. Whistleblowers are, are so screwed. And so, um, you know, we try our best to prevent them from from, from hurting themselves, but, you know, you can't do anything. I, I really wanted to leave it on the note that the floors are really rude and then give it to me. Can I just tell them to read one thing? So if you're going to Google the um, manifesto of John Doe, and John Doe uh, is an, uh, it's a, an assumed name and is the whistleblower of the Panama Papers. And his, his manifesto is a real amazing like, x-ray into the mentality of whistleblowers, the, the plight of, of whistleblowers, the challenges they face, and as he said, he would be willing to cooperate with a lot of people, a lot of sectors, including governments and prosecutors, but he can't do it. He can only rely on journalists, as he said, because there are no protections for whistleblowers like him or her. And we don't know if it's the though, for all that we know, um, out there to, um, to really be um, contributing this crucial information in a more um, you know, um, uh, open manner to other parts. Thanks. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Starting, there's someone doing the. Hi, I'm Richard Skinner from uh, Johns Hopkins University, and I'm kind of following up on what Danielle uh, concluded with, which is sort of the downside of technology, and that we've seen certain actors, probably in some way connected uh, to different governments around the world, use social media to, in large part, attack those uh, critics of uh, corrupt and dictatorial regimes using social media to discredit independent media, using it to discredit uh, critics of these regimes, and oftentimes it kind of encourage a general cynicism among the public that, oh, all these people are corrupt, so who cares? I mean, just do it for the biggest crop. Uh, so, so, so how can we respond to that? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I'm not a specialist of the attacking government with the so, uh, or activists with social media, but my, our colleagues did amazing work for revealing this fabric of trolls who comments a number of times and who have the salary for commenting it and uh, a very amazing and a very complicated work for revealing these fabrics especially uh, Russian related groups. Uh, but I don't think that it really works. Uh, it works for, for the small period of time uh, when people don't understand who are the, who are the comments that they, uh, they read. Yeah. But in fact, uh, in, in Russian media, the totally uh, lack 
of space for not for commenting but for sharing any kind of information and social media is only the right way to providing some information to the people uh, and I think in, uh, it's a, only the first step uh, when we see some problem like comments and paying trolls and uh, the second point is, point is the uh, Cam Cambridge group yeah okay. Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica, yeah, who did another part of work who show some advertising for the certain group of people and it works and we see how it works. And I don't think that it's, uh, there is some remedy for this issue, but uh, maybe uh, sharing some knowledge for the people, for readers, and to, to give them the understanding of these comments on the one way. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, technology is always a two-edged sword. And so the same, you know, technology allows us to reach a large number of people with our stories. And I think, you know, there, there's, there's always going to be narratives that are pushed out there by various interests. You know, you have governments pushing interests, or crime groups, you know, various uh, political factions all over the world are pushing these various narratives. And the only way to really co counter them is by a lot of the truth all the time. I mean, you, you know, that's why we have to be better is, as reporters, people learned, you know, for a long time that a, a two, you know, two-dimensional story in the newspaper with a byline and a title meant that you could trust it, and that worked for a couple hundred years, and then until that was defeated, and people now have got this concept of fake news in their heads, and so people are imitating that, and it's a simple imitation, and it worked. Um, and now what we have to do is um, create credible news, um, and that's through the organizations that are credible, the reporters that are credible. And the, and the content that is credible. And so we have to go deep. We have to show the fact checking in our stories. We have to show the data that's behind this. We have to show the wealth of information and the people that support this, <coughs> you know, the, the, the truth of this information. And that's the only way to do it. They're, they're demanding a higher standard now. We can give it and they can't give it very effectively. And so that's where we go next, I think. What is happening in the other direction of people having transparency and having meetings online and collecting their money online so everybody can see it? I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. I'm not sure we quite understand. Can you expand a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, you have good examples of the other way, like people are doing crowdfunding, so people Thing and how well is that working? Is that overcoming the problems that decided? I think we're in the early stage stages of overcoming all these problems. I mean, you know, we're, we're believers in massive transparency of everything, and you know, you can eliminate all crime and corruption with transparency. If we made all our bank accounts available to somebody, you know, that they could go through it, we could get rid of you know uh, criminality and corruption. You know, we're also transparency is obviously part of the solution. It's just how willing we are to go too far. You know, if, if you make transparency, if you make ma the world massively transparent, and then, you know, when somebody misuses that transparency, make that a crime, you know, maybe we'll have less serious crimes that we're dealing with in the world, you know, than the corruption that is capturing states. So, um, you know, I, I think that there needs to be a lot. I don't think there's enough done in transparency and that there needs to <laughs> and, and I think it works uh, to some extent because what we do as journalists, you know, we're kind of shallow. I mean, in our work, you know, lots of times, but what we do well is we unite worlds, you know, experts from all sorts of fields and, and all that. So I think the biggest reward for us when we post something online, like a static art as well in the database and all that, is when someone comes, uh, comes at us and says, hey, your article is actually quite shallow because look, there's this other dimension in the data, and that's wow, wow. Because you know, there's lots of people out there that are smarter than us. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Adam Zagger, and I work for the Project on Government Oversight. Um, I was looking at a couple of the Miami articles about uh, uh, about uh, uh, 
Russian ownership of luxury condominiums in Central and South Florida. Um, and I've actually, I, I guess that's been a phenomenon uh, for, for, for some period of time. Uh, and of course, Miami has been a nexus for capital flight from South America for many, many years. And I wasn't um, aware, uh, so, so some of these people uh, are allegedly, the Russians are involved in organized crime. But the purchase of these properties is not itself a crime. I don't believe the, the articles allege that. Um, and so what struck me about it was that uh, the lady there was talking earlier about criteria for what you write about. Um, and in my experience, the, the most effective writing, it's not the only measure, but is when you write something or somebody writes something and it cause, it either leads to an investigation or, or a political problem or they lose their job. When people lose their jobs as a result of articles because they're being accused of things, um, it, it can, it, it, the effect uh, is, uh, you know, it creates an advertisement for other people who are doing the same thing, that they need to be much more careful and that it can be very inconvenient for them if they persist in this activity. Now, the, the South Florida uh, money, you know, property purchases of the Russians, I mean, it, it's an interesting awareness for people to have, but I mean, is there any law against this? Do, do, do people in Russia who read about this kind of capital flight, uh, they may have currency restrictions, but I'm not aware that they did. I mean, in other words, what is the point? Yeah. So what is the story? Yeah, what is the so what? Um, the main problem that these guys who are mentioned in these articles uh, somehow related with the organized crime groups and purchasing this uh, property is kind of money laundering. Yeah, because it's uh, uh, guys who are related with Taiwanchik is, is one of the leaders, Taftahun uh, of one of the leaders of the organized crime, not only in Russia, but all over the world, one of the leaders of the global mafia. And he has neighbors, and these neighbors are totally involved in the same uh, crimes, and it's very, Specific point for me, uh, why why are you asking this question? Because it's uh, it's facts that uh, are interesting for public. The first uh, answer. The second uh, answer. Personally, I am focusing and my organization focusing on crime, crime in context of corruption, and uh, we revealing some groups. Not only the person who are in Trump Towers, but there are too many Russian public officials or former public officials who have no money, who have no salary to buy in this property. It's kind of illicit enrichment. It's not about the uh, celebrities or writing about post about, I don't know, the great person who have uh, money to buy in this property. But we are focusing on two persons and there were two, two persons that uh, really uh, we are caught on these cases. It's one former general major of Russian law enforcement agency, agency who are responsible for fighting against corruption and uh, and he's buying property in the United States for $40 million. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so my question just is, 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 is like, what is this going to be a problem when the people in Russia or the government in Russia reads these articles? I mean, what happens? Yeah. yeah. Uh, even, even you know that, uh, for example, Transparency Russia is included in the list of foreign agents organization. We are, we are, have very big pressure from the government side. We have a number of uh, low seats from the government officials for, for reputation, uh, um, yeah, and uh, even public publishing these uh, stories, for example, the guy who was the head of the state-owned corporation, he was fired from his post. It's an incre incre incredible result for Russia. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, he was fired, and, and there is no reaction from the FBI or FinCEN. No reaction. Yeah, but he was fired, after this article in Russian side, yeah, it's it's totally. I think it's one of the results. Nobody yeah, gets, 
fired yeah. from Germany. Yeah, nobody fired from, <laughs> from, from the, our, our uh, articles and so on. Yeah, Paul would like to Wait, uh, yeah, uh, I, I just thought with this, I mean, you know, governments very seldom act on our information. Because there's corruption, lots of these uh, issues that we're investigating are much ahead of the law enforcement, you know, and, and all that. So this, these are all problems. But what we've seen, you know, in the past years is that this stops criminals from doing business as usual. We get letters from criminals saying, hey, you got to take our name from that article from your website because we tried to get a loan from this bank and the bank did not give us the loan. So this is real impact. It, in fact, it, it impacts their business. Once you're outing someone who's investing in, you know, property in Florida, you know, the other criminals are going to think twice they want or not to invest in Florida because they know that they can be also exposed. So this increases the cost of corruption. So there's real effect there. I mean, our reporting at OCCRP, we had a, a budget, you know, over 10 years of about maybe 10 million. Yeah. And we contributed to, to recovering more than 4 billion US dollars, you know. From criminals, so state, you know, governments recovered uh, this, this money from from criminals. This is about increasing the, co the cost of corruption. It's not about prosecution doing their job. It's not about police doing their job, because at the global level, there's no law enforcement against these people. But these people are all operating. I mean, the, the high level operators, the money launderers, and all this are operating at a level where there's no enemy. So I, I'm going to do one final round of questions. The first story, and then you, and then the actor, but this gentleman. And then we're shutting. I'm Laura Sherman. I used to work volunteer for TIUSA in its previous, when it existed, and just come back from Serbia doing anti corruption. But my question is really to Drew, because you mentioned how hard it is to work with uh, American journalists because of the newspaper mentality and the competition. My view of the newspaper situation is that it is so hard for newspapers to stay in business that their view of competition is not such a bad view. Um, and part of the issue I would be interested in hearing your views is how do you address the economics of, of journalism to make it more viable? Uh, you can't stay. I don't blame the American journalists for, for this. I understand the pressure that they're under. Um, but but really we need to stop think of stop thinking of journalism as a business and start thinking of it as a public good. Um, and it's a public good that's not funded well. And it's it's a, it's it's a real problem. And so, I mean, it, as long as they can make money, that's great. I, I'm not against making money. I think it's wonderful. We, we we try everything we can to make money to do it. But let's, you know, when you're putting on, you know, meetings and when you're selling T-shirts, that's not a business. You know, that's survival. And, and most American journalism is in survival mode. And so, um, you know, there should be billions of dollars invested in it. If we're returning to forty-four thousand percent return on the dollar for OCCRP, you know, and ICIJ is probably a similar number. Shouldn't, shouldn't you know, people interested in the public good be putting tons of money into this because it pays back. There, there's a study done that says for every dollar invested in investigative reporting, it brings back a hundred dollars in public good. You know, uh, we, we desperately need more of this. No, nobody's really funding it. Uh, it's, it's, one percent of all a uh, world uh, uh, media development fund uh, world development funds go to media. Only one percent of that goes to investigative reporting. So so it's pathetic. It's it's one one hundredth, maybe one one thousandth of what it really needs to be. Uh, and as a society, we need to figure out how to pay for it. We don't have a way of doing that right now. Uh, this is just a serious problem. And one response is these collaborations. These collaborations have shown media organizations that were not investing in investigative reporting that is so worthwhile to do that. They have gotten, the majority of the partners report uh, highest traffic sometimes than ever in their history. Uh, they report like, they even sell more papers if they still do such thing. Uh, their brands are bigger, they're, there's prestige associated with it. They gain so much uh, by uh, throwing themselves into this risky uh, global collaboration corruption issue. So they've learned that. So I'm not saying that that's going to fix their 
uh, uh, financial problems, but uh, it's encouraging them. Uh, and not every story is going to be a collaboration. That's not. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Kantuya. I'm from Mongolia. And first of all, congratulations to our uh, dear uh, neighbor uh, because you fired <laughs> the official in my country. They are with the, even the, when the Panama Papers revealed that they are really crime, organized crime members and you know, have these uh, corruption uh, issues. They are uh, appointed as the prime ministers or the ministers or, um, and it's like a hopeless uh, case. Um, but because it's the lessons from around the world, I want to go away with the lesson. Uh, and um, the, the issue in my country is that really people are feared, afraid to you know, become whistleblowers or even the journalists afraid to raise the issue. And you mentioned that you know, the activists uh, get away silently after getting some money. They are so... Um, Threatened. They're not only them, but their whole family, their whole community. So, in that situ uh, cases, what would you advise, and what's the best, uh, you know, uh, practice? Thank you. Just very briefly, what we do, and uh, we've been working more and more with Mongolian journalists, and both the Paradise and Panama Papers have had uh, uh, stories, and even before that, uh, I think I were first leak. Osho leaks wrote down a member of Parliament who flew all the way to Washington to be with us. <laughs> and it was interesting, just a quick time ago, he was like, um, I promise you that it was, uh, it was bigger, it was the, the, in the bank account in Switzerland, I only had $1 million. We didn't know how much money he had. So that was like a <laughs> impactful story that made it even better. And then he did his job. Um, some of the strategies we use uh, is to uh, collaborate with those journalists in, in difficult uh, countries. Uh, but, but if colleagues in other countries publish the story first, but that sometimes it helps them because you know it, it's that kind of the power of the pack. They are not isolated. They are not just themselves against a big corrupt system in their country, but they are part of like a huge network of colleagues who are getting the story out first, and they can follow in a more effective manner. I think that 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 um, that works to protect journalists and sometimes. Um, you know, we saw in the case of Daphne Carrera Galicia in Malta who recently um, assassinated and assassinated and, and one of the things with Daphne, she, she was working alone and uh, she was taking all the risks of so, so what I encourage journalists in uh, working alone. No, I mean, yeah, uh, nobody would like to, uh, nobody would do this work in Mongolia. Only Mongolian people can do this work. Nobody can do this work, and nobody can can do can go this way. Only Mongolian people, and only the one one advice: be strong and keep going. Only. Good more question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Linda Kemp, and I'm a systems analyst consultant in an IT for a very long time. Um, so I'm also into advanced technology. So I have a couple of questions. Oh, and I need to say that I am originally from the south side of Chicago. So organized crime awareness is kind of in my DNA. <laughs> okay. um, so I have uh, several questions. One of which is um, you have all this data available, right? To what extent is the intelligence community both in the US and internationally, the five eyes, et cetera, taking advantage of that data. So, um, so that's number one. Number two, um, if there were a technology uh, platform that was um, quite a bit more sophisticated uh, and scalable than Cambridge Analytica had right now, uh, and I'd be, I would like to talk to somebody if there's any interest whatsoever, uh, would there be any interest in that? And then my third question is, um, there's uh, potentially a way, and I haven't heard this from anybody yet, there is potentially a way to undermine um, the global um, uh, transnational uh, money laundering, the hidden accounts, you know, the, the shell companies, et cetera, 
the wire transfers, all of that kind of problem. Um, there is potentially a way to undermine that as opposed to attacking it directly. So if it's something that I would trust that like one of you guys <laughs> uh, to talk, you know, launch that idea to see if there might be a there there, I would love to do that. Okay, well, we'll talk to you on number three. Um, the five, I, we, we, we don't talk to intelligence agencies, nor do we share anything. Um, we, we only do it amongst uh, journalists um, and, and now with, with some uh, uh, activist organizations that, that we work with. And so, um, you know, it's just important that, that you, uh, you know, that the data, that people be protected and that we, we can't cooperate with law enforcement directly as media. Um, because it's just dangerous for us. We talk to organized crime people all the time. They know we're talking to law enforcement. It's a problem for us. So we, we kind of we, we kind of play. Everybody is equal to us. Final question. I understand. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Andre, a friend, of the Foreign Service officer with the State Department. Uh, but uh, TI does an annual survey of perceptions of corruption. Uh, is there any correlation between the actions taken in countries that are affected by the uh, uh, by the various uh, revealings of your of your investigative the journalism uh, and the uh, the um, the survey, for example, in countries where there are where there's a high perception of corruption. Is there more reporting about what's in the what's in the uh, database, or does the public uh, rise up in revolt in countries where there is a low perception of uh, corruption? Do people step down? I mean, I don't know. I'm just uh, are there are there different impacts based on that uh, survey? Well, can you pass the microphone <laughs> to you? I will introduce you to Coralie Pring, who is our uh, research lead for International. I, I actually wasn't sure I, I totally understood the question. Is, is your question whether or not when we do all this great reporting and then, and, and then a, a, a rise in the perceptions of corruption? Now, is there the, uh, assumedly the, the survey is about the perception rather than actual corruption. So it's, it's it, the public has a sense that there is more corruption in a country or less percent, uh, corruption in a country. This reporting, in the way and the way that it would be reported by by uh, newspapers, by media, would sensationalize or heighten even, uh, even further right. that perception. So, is the action that's that is, is the action in a country where there's a high perception of corruption different than the action taken in a country where there's a low perception of corruption? Yeah, it's a very good question for not for the uh, freedom for, for freedom countries. It's not a good question, but uh, for non freedom countries, it's a very good question because we we trying to estimate and understanding the correlation between uh, perception and other situation. For example, investigation reporters, uh, as to me and uh, as I understand this. Uh, uh, this investigative reporting is an opportunity for government bodies to show their integrity, to show how they had to react on this, and, and if uh, the reaction is good enough for people, they increase, uh, decrease the level of uh, uh, perception of corruption. But if there is no reaction or bad reaction, the level of uh, perception is increasing. Very easy, yeah. Um, yes, and just to, just to add on that, um, yeah, so it's the experts' um, perceptions of corruption, that's how the CPI um, calculations are based, so it's, it's actually experts, not the public's perceptions, and so um, just like my colleague from Russia mentioned, what we're looking for is governments to take the right steps and show that they are addressing corruption risks, and that over time that should show an improvement in their CPI score if they are actually making genuine efforts to fight corruption, that would be picked up. But one aspect that has been talked a lot about is that it's the perceptions of the level of corruption in the public sector of a country and what the CPI doesn't pick up on is um, the cross-border flows of money and how um, rich Western countries are often the recipients of corrupt flows of money and that's one aspect we'd like to look at a bit more in future is how we capture 
um, those cross-border corruption risks uh, better. Any correlation between I think one of the things that we see is that there's not enough uh, perception in the U.S. of the role that the U.S. plays yeah. as an enabler of the global corruption system. Yeah. Uh, and so that's a result of one of our paper, papers that they uh, they still think that it's a Cyprus story, that it's a, uh, uh, a Caribbean story, uh, and not that the elephant in the room and the exhibit one is the United States. I think that is exactly the message I want to end today on. Um, also, because there's wine over there, there might be some <laughs> toast during the reception, but I think that's exactly right, and that's why we're here today. Exactly why we're here today. So, I want to say a special thanks to the panelists, to the discussants, to Netta, to Christy, who's I don't know where she's gone, and to the organizers um, for our first Democracy Dialogue. And just a round of applause for all.